So today I'm going to talk about plugin development. So me and already a little bit describe who I am. I'm Mark Hein. I'm the founder of Code Kitchen and currently work at hosting company 101. I'm a long time WordPress core contributor, um, the current lead of Blockpress. I did some work on the image editor stuff and building plugins like Deckify and Screen. So the first question is, what makes my plugin great? And you're wondering, especially if there's competition, if you write the next analytics plugin, then you're wondering well, uh, what, what makes my one unique and what can I do better than the rest? So first thing is, have a good code structure. Having like need as WordPress does, so people think you're a really good developer, even though you may be not that good as they think, only because your code is really structured. Um, offer the needed API, so expect that people want to extend your plugin. If you write something like Google Analytics, expect that they want to probably add some values on the output of the script. Um, clear everything up, after the plugin is deactivated, and play with it. Um, implement fallbacks like no, yes, if there's JavaScript error that it still works, or if someone is using an older version of WordPress, that the, your plugin still works on a decent level without breakage. And then you have the design part, like it should be well designed, it should fit in how WordPress does things. And the UI needs to be that the user doesn't need a manual to read, but directly knows I need to click on those buttons to get my actions done. And then you have the readme file that it needs to have first certain structure that people can use it, and also that it works for WordPress.org. And especially after that, don't try to be sneaky. Don't try to add advertisement to buy other plugins, activate other plugins, your teams. So try to avoid advertisement there. And what I said before, like make your plugin unique. Don't try to be the next form plugin that is basically the same, basically the same functionality, only the author is different and the code structure is different, but the output is the same. Um, after that becomes building your workflow. Um, so in my case, I will always say use version of control. So if there is a bug, then you know where it happened. Um, the same reason is that you need a ticket system. Know what you change, why you change it, and create as much, much log, uh, log files as needed. And invest time to choose your editor. So in my case, I use Sublime. If I want to extend it, I can do it easily. Um, I use Git as version control. And most of the time I use GitHub for public projects. And GitLab, but it's basically GitHub clone for private. Everything is the same like GitHub. It has this ticket system, a wiki pages, I can upload designs, discuss with other people what, uh, how it should look like. It's the same how we now currently, me and Milan, manage WP Serbia. It's on my GitLab server. If he commits stuff, it automatically gets pushed to the website. I can see what he does, and if something goes wrong or whatever, I can refer to it, leave a note behind it. Um, for UI, I use Tower in the GitHub app, depending on what. And for SVN, I use SVNX for the Mac, but it depends on if you have Windows, what you would use there. Um, it seems easy to say, but you need to understand WordPress. So I, my plugins got better when I got contributed back to WordPress. Because if I write a patch, most likely more people will say that my code is wrong than if I release a plugin. The, the audience is different. If you build a plugin, you build it for users that don't care about the code, no, don't care about design, they care that it works. If you do it for WordPress, then people expect that your code looks good, it use the code standards, and if it doesn't, you have to do it again. And again and again, until it works. Uh, and also know the requirement of WordPress. It sounds easy to say, but most likely 30-40% of the plugins on WordPress.org fail because of missing server requirements. There are a lot of plugins that expect you to have a PHP 5.3 version or higher because they, they, those developers implement something that they should not have. Um, know what kind of MySQL requirements you have. Know that GD or Imagic is installed. Uh, know that mod rewrite or something similar should be installed to make WordPress work and that you use that. Uh, that said, if you build a plugin, don't rely on HTAccess, for example. My servers don't run on Apache and if you use HTAccess, my plugin, will, my server will not respond on anything and the user will think that the plugin fails. Uh, 
done. Also, it's really important what I already said, like how your code is structured. Know how to build and what to do with that. Look at WordPress, for example. There's a lot of cool APIs you can work on. So here's a list of APIs WordPress has. Uh, for a lot of developers, and even in, if you look at again repo, a lot of people still use uh, direct calls to HTTP APIs like curl. But if they would have used WordPress code, even if I don't have curl installed because I've got it, WordPress will still work. If a plugin relies on having curl installed, I will find out. I can still install it, but the normal user will not find out. They will probably blame the hosting company instead of the plugin developer. Obviously, the hosting company needs to have curl installed, but you can't rely on that. And we have so many other cool API functions in WordPress that could work out of the box even without using WordPress. Um, we also have like a lot of hooks, and I mean a lot. We have now probably around roughly 2,000 hooks only on, on WordPress. And it makes WordPress run. We can build plugins, we can build teams because of this system. And basically everything can be adjusted by those hooks. Doesn't mean that you can do it with PHP. Sometimes you need to use JavaScript to make things happen. Um, and Understanding what every single hook does is really important because you don't want to load the hooks too early. And what I said, follow the code standard. Go to this URL, you will find out the PHP code standard, like use tabs for indentation of spaces. The same goes for JavaScript, the same goes for CSS, and all those standards make you a better developer. Um, and then we come to the part that you build a plugin. And in my case, what we just described earlier is to define the structure. Like, have what, what does the main file do? The main file, in my case, is almost em always almost empty. Um, use the plugin name as the main file name because that's how all the plugins do. If you don't do it, things can break. And put most of the files in a folder. In my case, I only have folders and the main plugin file in the main directory. I don't try to over make it overcomplicated there because it makes like garbage there. And I always do it like an object oriented programming. Um, doesn't mean that the code really is object oriented, but at least I defend myself for prefixing things. Uh, and I have folders like CSS, images, JavaScript, ink, lib, depending. Includes will be my own code, lib library will be for um, other people's code, and I have my languages. What I said, prefix everything. Even if you use a library for someone else, try to prefix it. There are many plugins that use OAuth, for example, and a lot of plugins just include it. And if two plugins don't prefix it and don't have a check if this clause exists, then load it. If you suddenly do use it, activate it, it completely breaks the website. There are many cases every year that this kind of thing happens. And also use the functions from WordPress. So don't use uh, like plugin URL and then my plugin name slash image whatever. Try to use the plugin their part of plugins URL. The same we have for Teams. This way, if I change the plugin directory or move it to a must-use plugin directory, uh, whatever I do, it still works. If I use SSL, it still works. I don't get mixed content because I use the functions of WordPress. And it's also by cleaning and setting things up, like use the activation, deactivation, uninstall stuff to clean things up. If I activate a plugin, I can then set the default values of the options table. Uh, deactivation, I can clean it up if I think it's needed. And if I think I should do it in the uninstall, I can do it there. So if someone deactivate, activate, then it still has the settings. But when they say uninstall, then I clean up the whole database. It is to be a good citizens for your users that use your plugin that they don't have all the crap. For example, like you log all fatal errors or notices in the database that you want to clean it up when the user deactivated because after it's deactivated, that data doesn't have any value. And what is and what's really important, find the right hook. Don't try always to use in it. Try to see if there is a hook what is later. And don't obviously do it too late because then the code may not even get fired. And add your own hooks. In my plugins, I always try to build in my own hooks so people can extend them as much as possible. For example, my Tabify plugin has so many hooks, and 
and only it does is prototype, but if a plugin like bots or advanced custom fields want to add for taxonomy, they can add it and it works. They can use the hooks to say, oh no, we also accept the post types, we want to have taxonomies and they can add taxonomies and my whole UI will change to those new features because I already built it in but I never built in the logic to work for it because WordPress doesn't support it out of the box. And then you have the security aspect of building plugins. The first thing is don't do anything stupid or even too smart. Even too smart can mean that you create um, what you don't think is a mistake, but you make a mistake why people can then hack you. Uh, one of the things is always include like index.php in every folder and include like something like the, if this isn't the mind apps pad, then just kill this page because you call my plugin directly. And by this way, if people have their battle log completely on, the hacker doesn't get information where your website is located at. If it shows an error, it knows, okay, you're in slash home, slash your website, slash index.php, there was the error from. And then, when you need to care about user validation. And this is the more tricky part of building plugins. I was playing with it a few, a few years ago, like checking out what is the right function for what. And it's really hard to do. Even the, the SEO plugin from Yoast, they applied a lot of this kind of functions towards it and they completely broke stuff because they were doing too much. And you always need to find the right way. Like for int while apps int is for, if you want to be sure it's enough. But you need to know if it's two string, like first the number two, then the word, word, string, word string, it will return two because it gets the first value. Um, and then you have really cool things like WP key says for HTML validation, SK for HTML, for text areas, for text fields. Don't use escape attribute for variables. It's basically only to, for meaning for at, uh, attributes from your HTML. That was basically my first mistake, and I know a lot of people do that. And a lot of articles online that still say that you should use escape attribute to escape stuff, even if it doesn't really do anything in that play, because it only checks if there are not do no double quotes there. If there are double quotes, then there will be escape. That's the only thing with that function does. And you have way more, like you can escape JavaScript, escape URLs, escape emails, to be sure the data is what it should be. And all the stuff you can find at this URL, like data validation shows all the functions there is. And on the metadata and synthesizing and escaping from user data, you'll find some other code samples how to do so. And the same goes for database stuff. Like don't try ever to use variables directly in the query. If you want to do something like that, try to use prepare. So you can say um, percentage sign s, and then the second in the query, and then after that, comma, and say it's my variable user, or username, whatever. That way, our database class validates if the value is correct and splits everything out. So even if they do something horrible wrong, like they try to hack in your database, we as WordPress core people, we will try to not make that happen. And if at one point it, there is a security issue there, we can fix it in core and you're already safe. And the same goes for permissions. Know what your user wants to do and what they do. Um, use current user can to find out if they have the right permissions. Um, you can use also user can if you only have the use variable but you doesn't have to be from the current user. Um, also know the intention of the user by using nonsense. Like if you added meta web boxes before, you know WP nonce field and WP verified verified nonsense. You want to be sure that the user did the action himself and not a script that just called the URL and hope, hoping that it still works. And as I told you before, I released a few plugins myself on WordPress.org. And one of them was Tabify Edit Screen. It enables to create tabs on the Edit Screen so you can manage where the um, meta box is displayed so you can clean up the, edit, the first Edit Screen so that the user is not overwhelmed by uh, Google Analytics, SEO from Yoast, all the meter boxes plug in there, you can easily clean it up. But the biggest issue is, 
we as plugin developers don't use add meter boxes, right? We always try to only add that action when we are on a certain base. Then we add it. But basically why we do it is to add JavaScript to certain pages. We should never always split it because we should never add that kind of logic before adding that action. We should always basically put add action from the add meter boxes in the main file. And if we want to add JavaScript to certain pages, then we can do it because it's a difference between the, those two things. Like you want to know that you want to say to WordPress, like, yeah, we have this meta box. But you, after that, when the page is loaded, then you want to say, oh yeah, this meta box is not trying to load. Also, not need just scripts and styles. And what I said, most of the time they do it is because of lazy loading to have some performance. But the golden rule is expect WordPress will change. WordPress will never be the same. At this moment, we only display meta boxes on the edit and new post screen. But we can do the same for taxonomies or other pages. And suddenly the plugin breaks for those pages, and then they have to adapt. So always, as a plugin developer, expect that WordPress will change. And during the road, I also made my own mistakes. Uh, I've got to update my JavaScript code. So I worked on my PHP code to make it work. And I added like support for not only post type but also for taxonomies, at least in the code that is there. And I totally forgot to update the numbering. Um, even worse, I had three first in a day of this plugin. And it was not the only time, and it happened two times already. And so in 051, I forgot to add that I changed the location of the tabs. I was playing around, and my plugin didn't have unit test at that moment. So I changed the location of the tabs to test out what, if, how it would look, but I never referred to that back. Um, and I was also playing too much with the code. So in this code sample, I was used as slashes for my tabs. But probably, in this case, escape underscore JavaScript was probably better because what this code does is it creates a new function and say this little piece of JavaScript should be added there when it's time. But I don't need to use as slashes there. I can use escape JavaScript because it's JavaScript code that I want to display. Know the function, what you're going to use where. Um, that was even more stupid. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people did this. Copy pasting from Google or whatever website you can find code. Obviously, if you do that, change the variable name. I'm pretty sure variable is not in my code. But what makes this a good plugin? I mean, learn from my mistakes. That's the biggest thing I did here. And it's still unique. I try to care about UX, even as a developer. I want to make it perfect. Um, as far as I know, it will never show in PHP numbers. I really care about that. I'm trying to find ways, let other people try to find ways to show something up, and I will fix that. And I also care, I really care if plugins fail, like the plugin of Ghost will not show up the meta box. I'm still now working on finding my way. If they do something wrong, then I can still show the meta boxes in my setting page. Um, I even have specific design CSS files for color schemes. So WordPress now has eight color schemes. And I try to find ways to, if I change to that, I show the right color. So my button will change, my colors will change. I will read and guess what kind of color I should use for what. And I can do that because the color scheme always has four colors. And I guess that the colors look like how it should. But if the, your guess and your assumption is right enough, then it's fine. A button doesn't always have to be blue. You need to find ways to still make it looking better if the whole color scheme is not black anymore, but it's basically pink. That one little blue button is probably not the way you want to go. And you also want to make it work for if there's no yet JavaScript. That case is lower and lower, but no JavaScript doesn't mean that the browser doesn't support it. But it can also mean the user has accessibility issues. And in a lot of presentations, people say everyone has accessibility issues. You can have be, uh, be colorblind and you have no clue that you're colorblind. And you want to find out how to deal with that. And it's always good to experiment what to do with it. And as last comment, always try to experiment. Play with code, create plugins that doesn't make sense at all. On the WordPress repo, I have a plugin called um, YouTube DJ. 
and doesn't make any sense for anyone to include it on their website. But it's really cool to play with. I'm now playing with full screen API from browsers. I will probably never need it, but when I need it, I have it there. I have the knowledge, I play with it, I learn my JavaScript knowledge better, and I can do cool stuff with it. Um, that was my presentation. Khala Bunu's Slus Sanya. Thank you. Any questions? So there are three scenarios you need to encounter for. Um, so there are basically the two plugins I, from my head now I could recommend you uh, to look into. Um, Hi. Um, I think what he was trying to actually say, he was trying to, uh, to see if you know anything about a visual proposal, but my question actually connects to that. What do you think about uh, theme frameworks? Because right now, everybody's all up into it. Everybody's building team frameworks, and he was talking about Visual Composer, uh, Redux, and all of them. Uh, what do you think about it? Do you think it's way too much for WordPress? Uh, would you keep the team uh, administration as simple as possible? Would you extend it? What do you think about it? Team frameworks are an interesting subject. I kind of disagree with having parent teams. I rather have it as a plugin, at least for my websites, I have it as a plugin and have some shared code through a network installation. Um, but they are really powerful, like Genesis can get, really give you the power to have four parent teams and create really simple child teams, so that then you don't care about the parent team anymore and your child team is really simple. So with that logic, I can totally agree with that. The team should be really simple, but sometimes the team needs to be do complicated things. But you definitely agree that it should be a plugin and not actually be placed in a theme folder. It should be an actual plugin as a framework itself. So the question was, should it be really like in a plugin folder or on another team? I would say yes, but the problem then is we don't have that logic yet. Uh, so in most cases, probably having a parent team is totally fine because some, most of the time you want to make some little changes, but having say that the parent team is team framework for me goes too far, but I know a lot of people will disagree with me. 
in the end, it's all what you think would be best for you and for your customers because you should at one point, you know the customer the best. If you think my customer base have no problem with it, why change? Thank you, Peter. Okay, tell me your favorite plugin. You didn't want to tell me that one over lunch. Come on, at, at least the first setup when you're like setting the new website. What's the first plugin that you install? I will delete one plugin. <laughs> uh, can I guess which one is it? Is it Dolly? Hello, Dolly. My peace, man. I will delete everything. Why? It's a good plugin. They are it's good. good written. But do you use it for every website? No. 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 And that's the problem. I have no plugin in my projects that I would use for every project. No. Google Analytics probably would fit there that I would use for every project because people want to use analytics. But for my last project, I even did not use Google Analytics because I live in Germany. And Germans are really critical against um, their privacy data. So we are not basically allowed to use Google Analytics. So we use P-Wave for, uh, for the analytics we store for our blogs and our sites. Uh, so there's always a problem. We can also not use Agispen there. We use their own protection. And that's the whole problem with selecting the plugin. Not every plugin can be used on every website because by law, you're not able to. Uh, for most projects, I will use Gravity Forms. If I don't have to extend it, it's totally fine. I had to extend it one time. They have a lot of filters, a lot of actions, and I could make it happen that I have my own Google Maps and on that I could drop in every form if needed. And, but it does give you a lot of power. For that project, we basically use it for every form we need as many. And it gives us the power to our customers to say, oh, you want to add or change a little field? They can do so. Uh, probably that's the only plugin I use the most on all websites. And what is your favorite plugin that you wrote? Like the, the one that you said, like, you enjoy the most in the in the let's say. What? You enjoy the most when you were developing it. Yeah. What was your, your, your favorite plugin? I like Terrifying Edustream the most. Um, because it was challenging. For that for a use case. Um, except that one is the YouTube DJ one because it's kind of that lame, but also really cool because it added a lot of features there and a lot of JavaScript stuff to make it better. So I do check if the JavaScript files are compliant as a standard so that I don't make mistakes. I do check the JavaScript files there, um, except that I don't really have a lot of plugins in public yet, so I still need to work on that. Yeah, well. For those who haven't seen that plugin, it's the uh, YouTube DJ. You have like the, the setup of, for the A, A and B list. You're gonna, probably going to share the probably going to share the link, so you can be the DJ just on YouTube. You have the internet connection. Marco showed me that one in Norway, I guess, but that wasn't done. Yeah. So no, no it, 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 it should be extended. Should be should be. Yeah. So yeah, currently what you now see here is you can switch around, you can play music here. So by default it already has two users added there. It has short codes that you can only show one deck on one page. Um, I can say to a certain user, I want to play it. So I think this one should have some videos about WordPress. And so I leave. And it loads the image from YouTube. It loads all the videos that user has, like the last 50. And it plays then in both decks. So when one on the website, it's downloading, then on the right side it will continue playing. So from this project, I really improve my JavaScript skills because normally I will not have like relations between code. I really try to have some more orientated programming in JavaScript. And it 
basically, I won't, you can never use it in, on your own website, but for projects like this, it makes you a better developer because you're forcing yourself to play with JavaScript, with IX calls, uh, with APIs from other people. Um, and that's really important to do. Like, currently I'm also working with Node.js to make uh, some kind of like live actions possible that I can say as a website developer say like, okay, this YouTube movie now needs to be displayed to all my users. And those things are really powerful if you know that stuff because you can get new clients with it. I showed a Node.js example in when I was in work in Norway and I almost got like a new client there and that was one of the biggest WordPress agencies out of the world because I knew how to work with Node.js and with WordPress. And for that kind of knowledge, people do want to hire you. Some more questions? Marco, thank you so much. Thank you so much.